Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of Mark. Book of Mark. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, begin reading with verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. But what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Our message this morning is what will a man give in exchange for his soul? If a person is starving to death, and we've not had that problem in America, but if a person is starving to death and hasn't eaten in days and days and days, what would he give for some food? Remember Esau in the Old Testament who had been out hunting and came in and sold his birthright for a bowl of beans because he thought he was starving and he didn't see the importance of the birthright, so he sold his birthright for nothing more than a bowl of beans that would only satisfy for a very short time. If a person is drowning out in a lake, what would they give or what would they promise to give if somebody would come out with a boat or something and rescue them? If somebody offered to sell you a full Olympic-sized swimming pool full of 24 karat gold, what would you be willing to pay for it? Have you ever seen someone who is very, very, very sick, even to the point of dying? What would they give to be cured of their disease and restored back to health? You know, I've seen men especially, and, and maybe you ladies, but... I'm more familiar with us, with we men. I've seen men almost make idiots of themselves in order to get the attention of a lady that they want to meet and date. What would a man do? How ignorant, how idiotic would a man act in order to get the attention of, of Miss Beauty or whatever she is? I've seen young men go out and spend a hundred dollars for a stuffed teddy bear because he found out that this lady he's dying to meet like teddy bears. What would you give to win the heart of someone you think you want to marry? You know, we like to think about how much our house is worth. I was listening to Dave Ramsey last week and I've been listening to him usually at night on the way home. But somebody called in and, you know, they were wondering about their house. And he said, how much is your house worth? And, oh, it's worth two or three hundred thousand dollars, whatever it was. And, and he made a comment. He said, in reality, your house is only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. In other words, what would you give? What would you give? To get the dream house or dream car or dream gun or dream fishing rod, whatever it might be. We understand these things in the physical material world, 
But what we often don't understand is that the same thing is true in the spiritual realm. Every day, you and I make choices as to the value of our life, the value of death, the prospects of eternity, the assurance of either heaven or hell. Every day we make choices and place a value on those things. I get, I have to really watch myself. When you ask people, hey, we, we missed you, Sunday, where were you? Well, I had tickets to the front row of UK game versus, I don't know, who, who do they play next? I don't even know. Well, you know, I had front row seats, and to me, that was more valuable than attending a simple church service. You can put tickets or anything else you want to in there, but every day you make a choice. Do I want to read my Bible today or do I want that extra 15 minutes sleep? I know how easy it would be to hit snooze and I'll catch up tomorrow or the next day. Every day we make choices of whether I'm going to Say grace before lunch. Or am I going to just start eating like everybody else does? Every single day you make choices on what is important to you. I want to look today at our text and I want to look at the soul from a biblical perspective. And I want to ask each and every one of you, don't think about anybody else. Don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at the person across from you. Look at me or God. But I want to ask you, how much are you willing to give in exchange for your soul? Now, to understand the importance of the soul... We really have to go all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2. Because you see, in creation, God made man unique. During the week of creation, about 6,000 years ago, God created everything. He spoke, and the universe came into existence. He spoke. And suddenly the trees and the grass appeared. He spoke and the fishes of the sea appeared. He spoke and land animals all began to appear. In all of creation, all he did was speak and it happened. But not so with man. When God got ready to create man, he personally molded and shaped each part of Adam. From the dust of the earth, God took the dust and carefully molded and shaped and made Adam into what he is or was. When God made Eve, he didn't just speak, he took a rib from Adam's side and then he shaped and formed Eve perfectly and brought her to Adam. He did not do that with the animals. He spoke, male and female, introduce yourselves. He did nothing to introduce the animals of the field. He didn't perform a separate act of creation to mate, to mate the animals. But God made man unique. Special. God shaped and molded and designed every intricate detail of man's body. Then, when he had made man, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, I know some of you are going to have a question, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it now. Or answer it now. Do animals have a soul? Well, I think you need to define the word soul. 
In the Bible, the word soul and spirit are sometimes used interchangeably. And you have to look at the context to see which one is referring to. Animals can breathe. Animals can move around. Animals typically have a brain. And animals can be trained to perform some very sophisticated actions. In fact, some animals are smarter than some humans. Don't tell nobody I said that. But the soul that God gave animals there in that passage simply means they breathe, they move, they have a certain amount of brain. And some animals can even show some emotions. But animals, as much as you may love them, were never made in the image of God, nor did God ever breathe into animals the breath of life that he did for mankind. That is what makes man different from the animals. Man and man only was specifically made in the image of God. Man and only man specifically had God breathe into him the breath of life. Now I know I kid a lot and take a lot of jokes and things about how much I love animals. Snicker, snicker. I don't believe we should ever mistreat animals. They are part of God's creation. But understand that animals are not and never will be equal to mankind, nor can animals be saved like mankind. I went into a store Friday north of here. Never been there. They were the only one that had the particular thing I was looking for. So I went in and the guy was busy, so I'm looking around. And I turn around and there's this great big dog sniffing my leg. You know, and it's like, whoa, you know. And the guy said, oh, she, she's fine. She won't hurt you. Go ahead and pet her. She likes to be pet. If you pet her, you'll be fine. I said, sorry, man. I don't pet dogs. I'm sorry. I... I, I'm not a dog person. I, I've had some bad experiences. I, I, I don't do dogs. He said, oh, you're a cat person. I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I don't think we should mistreat animals. They are part of God's creation. But animals don't have a spirit like we do. Animals cannot be saved like we do. So what is the value of our soul? Man, because he was made in the image of God and had God's breath breathed into him, is different than from anything in the whole universe. The soul, sometimes called the spirit, is that which distinguishes us from Everything else that God created. When Adam sinned, his spirit died instantly and he broke fellowship with God. Because of the value of the spirit of man, God had already determined to buy back that which was lost. We use the word redeemed. The word redeem simply means to buy back. God had already determined to buy back that which Adam lost. The spirit of man was so important, so valuable to God, that God sent his only begotten son to earth to buy back, to redeem that which Adam lost. God gave his most precious possession to save that which Adam had lost in the fall. 
Jesus Christ left the glory of heaven and all of the majesty of heaven because the spirit of man was so important that that was the only way to save him. Jesus Christ came to earth as a man. He suffered as a man. He suffered all of the physical agonies of the cross. But the physical agonies were nothing compared to the spiritual agony that Jesus Christ suffered on the cross inwardly as he suffered our eternal hell. You see, flesh and blood. You know, many people make so much out of the physical death of Christ. It was horrendous. But other people had been crucified. Jesus was not the first person to be crucified. It wasn't just his physical body suffering that brought salvation. It was his spirit that which made us unique, it was His Spirit that suffered and paid for our sin. It was His Spirit that suffered the separation of God when He cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It wasn't just His physical pain. It was His Spirit pain for the sins of our spirit. That he might redeem us. Jesus Christ suffered everything that he did because the spirit that God gave man is so important that nothing else could redeem it. So what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Your spirit is so valuable. That Christ gave everything. That's how valuable it was to him. So what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I think sometime, and, and I know I do, and I'm sure that every one of you do as well. We forget that everything in this world... Everything in this world is going to be destroyed one day. You think about that. Everything in this world. Would I pay $100,000 for a truckload of garbage that's on its way to the dumpster to be burned? Not if I had my right mind. Would I strip myself, give up my house, my car, give up my food, my clothes? Would I give up everything I've got to buy a pile of rusty, molded, rotten stuff? I don't think most of us are that ignorant, are we? And yet that's what we do. Every day. We hold on to the things of this world. Even if it means. Losing the things that really matter. My oldest grandchildren are. Learning the value of money. Now before. I could say do you want two pennies for that dime and. They would think, I'm getting two for one. That's a good deal. But now, you know what? No. Come on, Grandpa. I'm not that dumb. I'll give you a quarter for a dollar. No, Grandpa. And yet, that's what we do every day to God. God says, I'll give you the joy and peace and the happiness of a Christian life. Nah, that's okay, God. I'd rather have this corruptible money that I can get. Your soul is eternal. Nothing you get in this life is eternal. 
we heard just last week the young man who just dropped dead of a heart attack, we, they think. You don't have to be old. I don't know the man, never met him, don't know anything about him. But how much of his bank account did he take with him when he died? Not a penny. How many guns did he take with him when he died? I got an email from Brother Jerry a couple days ago, and I'm going to write him back and say, Get thee behind me, Satan. He got a super, really super good deal on another gun, and uh, I, I have to pray hard that, you know, Lord, don't lead me into temptation. But Lord, I will sacrifice. I will sacrifice eternity to have the money for one more toy. I'll give up eternity to have the money for just one more extravaganza. Now, money itself isn't evil. You know, I've heard many people say, money is the root of all evil. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Ever since at least uh, Abraham, we know that men have always had some measurement to exchange for goods. Remember when Abraham brought, bought the burial plot for his wife Sarah? He negotiated the price, then he weighed unto him the amount that he had, the man had stated for the value. There's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with having money. But when I'm willing to give my soul for money, it becomes wrong. I've got a couple of scriptures. I want you to listen to these. Proverbs chapter 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. By the way, a modern word for sluggard would be a lazy, low-down, good-for-nothing. Consider her ways and be wise, which, having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. Solomon said, look at the ant. Even an ant has enough sense to know that you gather food in the summer because winter's coming and you can't gather it. I heard a man one time say that, you know, if I thought the Lord would come back... You know, next month I'd go out and buy a brand new Cadillac and not make the payments because I know God's going to come back and I won't have to. No, if he wants his brand new Cadillac, be like the ant. Provide your meat in the summer. And gather her food in the harvest. There's nothing wrong with laying up food and in this case, in the ant. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know what? My property taxes are going to be due in October. I think I'll wait till October the 30th and then pray for God to rain the money out of heaven. So no, we started, we paid it in October. We started in November, already putting our tax money aside, planning for the harvest or for the winter. So the, you know, the Bible says there's nothing wrong with planning ahead for what we used to call rainy days. Proverbs 13. My dad didn't do this, unfortunately, because he didn't have it, but a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. You know, even as I just read that, my dad did leave an inheritance. It just wasn't money. Uh, my father left a great inheritance, uh, godly home, godly children. But a good man leaveth an inheritance for to his children's children. 
Is it wrong to prepare for the future by saving reasonably? Not if God blesses you. I sometimes tell young, young parents, well, when should we start planning for college? The day after the baby gets home. Because it's going to take you that long to save up enough to go to college. There's nothing wrong with looking ahead. In fact, Proverbs 22 says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. I know there's evil coming. I'm going to prepare for it. There's nothing that I can see wrong with that. But understand that money will not go with you at death. And money will not buy you one ounce of gold on the golden streets. It's not wrong to save for the rainy day. It's not wrong if... And, and again, I was listening to Dave Ramsey, and this guy works in construction, so he only works about six or eight months out of the year, and he spends everything he makes during that six or eight months, and then the four months he's out of work, he has nothing to show, and he's begging everybody else for money. Now, if I know I'm going to be out for four months, I'm going to think ahead. There's nothing that I see wrong with that. But what I do see is what Paul described in 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now whether you've got a dollar in your pocket or a hundred thousand dollars in the bank is not the question. Are you content with godliness? I'll be happy when I get half million dollars in the bank. I told some of you I'm working on my second million dollars. Did y'all know that? I'm working on my second million dollars. I gave up on the first million. I never made it. So I'm working on my second one. It's not the money that's the issue. But people with money often are never content. How much do you make? Well, I make 60 bucks an hour. Why are you miserable? Because I want to make 80. I make $200,000 a year. What's wrong with that? I think I'm worth $300,000. You see, we're not content. It's not that money is an issue. It's that money doesn't satisfy. And until we learn to be content with godliness, we're never going to be content. I know people even today... I don't know how they do it. They make eight, nine, ten bucks an hour, maybe if they make that much. And you would think they were millionaires because they just, money isn't that important to them. Paul said in 1 Timothy 6 8, having food and raiment, let us be content. I know people, like I said, I, I don't see how they, they get by. But if you ask them, if you talk to them, I've got clothes to wear. I've got food to eat. What else do I need? That is contentment and that is great gain. Unfortunately, many of us, and I put me in a generic sense. Many of us, if we make $10 an hour, we want 15. If we make 15, we want 20. If we have $100,000 in the bank, we're going to put 200,000. When we get 200, we're going for 400. 
And many times, and this is what I see that, that concerns me, is that in doing that, they give their soul, their spirit in exchange. Let's see how good your memory is. Now, you real young ones, you're excused. I won't, uh, I won't expect you to know, but some of us who are over 40 or 50, let's see how good your memory is. Can you name the astronauts on the second landing on the moon? Now, come on, these guys were famous. They went to the moon and some of them landed on the moon and some of them walked on the moon. They were on TV. Does anybody remember their names? Nobody? Hmm. So fame doesn't last forever, does it? Can you name the fifth president of the United States? I would think a couple of you should get that one. All right, I see two that I would have expected. How about the rest of you? Can you name the fifth president of the United States? He was the president. He was the leader of the world capital. He was the leader of the greatest nation on earth. And you don't remember his name? Huh. Power comes and goes. Why? He's the president. But in just a few short years, nobody even remembers his name. Can you name the pitcher of the last game of the 14th World Series? You mean sports don't last forever? I mean, come on now. The World Series is the best of the best. And the pitcher of that winning game is hailed as some great, mighty celebrity. And yet sports come and go and we don't even remember his name. Fame comes and goes. Power comes and goes. Activity, fun, comes and goes. One of the preachers was talking yesterday at the prayer breakfast how that as a little child, he was as happy he was as happy as he could be with the little old bitty merry-go-round that went round and round and round and round. Unfortunately, a lot of people are spiritually still stuck with the merry-go-round and they're going around and around and around and around. And in doing so, they're sacrificing their spiritual being. If I go a month without eating, well, it'd be a good way to lose weight, but I probably, if I, I'm not sure I would live that long. Food is necessary to sustain this physical body. Gas is necessary to keep my car running. So too, spiritual food is necessary to keep your spirit going. And the power of the Holy Spirit is necessary to give us the power that we need to keep on going and going and going in the service of God. But so many times we starve our spirit so that we can gain a few extra dollars. We starve our innermost being so that we can have our 15 seconds of fame. And we starve our spirit and lose the power that we need to keep on keeping on. 
I'm going to make a general statement. Understand this is a general statement and may not apply to every single person. I know it applies to me, okay? I know it applies to me, and I doubt that I'm really that different than many of you. When I begin to get spiritually hungry because of spiritual neglect, and my will to serve and go on begins to dwindle because of loss of gasoline of the Holy Spirit, I can only speak for me. I find myself becoming, I tell my wife, what's wrong, hon? Nothing. I just feel blah. Sometimes it's because I'm sick and running a fever. Sometimes my pacemaker's acting up. Sometimes my stomach is acting up. Those things can affect you. But sometimes it's because spiritually I'm starving and I've run out of power with the Holy Spirit. What did I do that took away my food? Well, you see, the Reds were trying to play on TV and that was more important than reading the Bible and spending time with God. I'm not going to pick on UK because that, you know, that's... That's okay to watch UK. That's fine, you know. Just don't watch the Reds or the Bengals. Think about whatever it is in your life. Think about what you do. That you give in exchange for your soul, your spirit, your fellowship with God. Remember what David said when... David had sinned there, you know, with Bathsheba in Psalm 51. David didn't say, Lord, save me again. No, he didn't lose his salvation. But he said, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. You see, David had given a few moments with Bathsheba in exchange for the joy of of fellowshipping with God. What are you giving? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Would you exchange your soul for possessions? For power? I already showed you. The President of the United States, only two people in the auditorium well, three, the teacher. Only three people in the auditorium knew who the fifth president was. Now, I'm not a history buff. Can you name the 38th president of the United States? Most of you were alive when he was president. See, number 38 was, what, Andrew Jackson? No. But you see what I'm saying? What will you give in exchange for the joy of your salvation? What will you give in exchange for the spiritual food that you need to grow and nourish? Paul said, you know, put aside milk and, you know, milk belongs to babies. You need to grow so that you can partake of the meat of the gospel. Every one of these things will someday fade and pass away. I've told most of you, in high school, I was a member of the National Beta Club. Does anybody know what that is besides me? In, in our school, that was the elite of the elite. I had a pin, you know, National Beta Club, and I wore with pride. I have no idea where that pin is today. And you tell people, oh, I used to be a member of the Beta Club, and it's like, so? See, what I thought was so important in high school is gone 
and I even doesn't mean anything anymore. And all of these earthly things that we cling to, all of these things, I can't come to church. I got a, you know, I got a chance to work 36 hours overtime and I need that double time. Is it worth selling your soul? I know some places don't give you an option. But is it worth working 80 hours a week vol voluntarily so you can make more money and whether you put it in the bank or buy guns or cats or fishing rods, whatever, is it worth sacrificing your time with God to get it? Is there anything on earth worth losing out on spending time with the very God who died to save you? Every day you make choices of what you think your soul is worth. I think my soul is worth less than you fill in the blank. Is, is losing your joy and your eternal rewards in heaven. Keep in mind eternal rewards worth anything that you can gain down here. Sometimes I, talk, I hear people say, I'm going, to I'm going to get serious about serving God just as soon as, and you can fill in the blank. As soon as Johnny gets potty trained, as soon as Johnny gets in school, as soon as Johnny gets out of school, as soon as Johnny gets married, and pretty soon, you've as soon as, yourself right up in your 70, 80 years old and you never got around to serving God because you put everything else of more value than your soul. Now let me ask the closing question another way. Is there anything that you have or hope to have that's worth dying and going to hell forever and ever for. What would you be willing to burn in hell forever for? Oh, I'd go to hell for a new car. You know, unfortunately, that's exactly what a lot of people are doing. I can't serve God. i got to get a new car. I talked to a man. He called me Thursday. And um, we got to talking and... He said something about his car, and I said, you know, he said, my car doesn't run real good some days, and, you know, it's a little hard for me to get around. I said, well, what kind of car do you have? And it was like a 1992, 1996 Toyota. It's got like 400 million miles on it. You can do that with Toyota, you know. He's as happy as a lark doesn't care that his car's 30 years old, 20, yeah, 30 years old. He's content, he's happy, and he's serving God. What about you? Godliness with contentment is great gain. All the money in the world, if it leads to ungodliness, only produces misery. Father, we come. And Lord, even as I think about those who have heard the message and those who will hear the message, Lord, I can't open their eyes, I can't open their ears, I can't make them see nor hear. But Lord, I know that your Holy Spirit takes your word and your Holy Spirit plants that word into their hearts. May you plant the seed today. And if just one person commits their life to God, 
It'll be worth more than all the treasures this world has. May you bless even today. You know what each person here is. You know what each person here needs to do. May you burden them, may you convict them, and may they do thy will. In Jesus' name, amen.